your own? Well, I think tech raising public awareness about technology, energy, globalism, and diversification. As part of the Think Tech series, today's show is the Arts in Hawaii. I'm your host, Donna Blanchard, and joining me today is Charlie Medeiros of the State Foundation on Culture and the Arts, here to talk about funding for art in Hawaii. Welcome to the show, Charlie. Thank you. Our show is being streamed live on Ustream.tv and Spreaker.com. These links are embedded in our site, so to get to these live streams, just go to ThinkTechHawaii.com. And if you want to join us in our downtown studio, email jfidel at j at fidel, that's with two L's, dot com. Thank you so much for being here. I'm Thank you. Yeah. Looking forward to, I've been looking forward to this for a while, talking with you about mm -hmm. the SFCA, the programs that you work with, the yep. history of it, the, the, the present, and maybe we can even talk a little bit about the future of funding for the arts here. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, so tell me about, let's start with the formation of the State Foundation on Culture and the Arts. Okay. The, uh, basically, the, uh, I'm going to read the mission first. The okay. mission of the State Foundation is to promote, perpetuate, preserve, and encourage culture and arts, history and humanities as central to the quality of life in Hawaii. Okay. Uh, State Foundation was uh, created, was basically a vision of, uh, some real visionary people back in the 60s and uh, Alfred Price definitely he was he was the founder and but there were people that helped him in government and the whole idea was they believed Price's idea was they believed that you know art should be supported by government right he's a he's a it's interesting because he's a European person he's not he was not from the United States or anything he, and he's, he was an architect he was an architect right Exactly. He was an architect. He was a working architect. He did work here, on, I, I think, on the somewhere in Pearl Harbor, and he has various buildings around Honolulu that, he's, that he uh, designed. Yeah. yeah. But uh, at some point, he was uh, he saw what was happening in uh, on the mainland, and he heard of this thing that was starting to form called the National Endowment for the Arts. I mean, just out of the blue, right? So, being that he had that, uh, he was a visionary. He uh, researched it, you know, looked to see what was available, and he found out that it was basically going to be a source for funding for art. And uh, he basically uh, met with uh, Governor Burns at the time. I think it was uh, Najo Yoshinaga and Paniyoko Uchi. And the four of them, I don't know the timing of it, but they, he, they basically kind of, he basically uh, cajoled or... Uh, directed them, and they all got the same idea. That well, why not? Let's see what you know what happens. Because Price was he was pretty out there. He was a like I said, he's a visionary, and he had a a real um, strong vision of what he wanted to see in art here. Because he's he's from Europe, and their 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 perspective on art is real different. It's very different. It, it well, like your mission statement that says art is part of the quality of life. Yeah. I think in Europe it is more. Widely yeah. believed yeah. that it's, just, it's yeah. integral to our health. Yeah, it's it's you know you you walk down some boulevard in Paris and somebody's, you know, has a chalk and they're drawing a picture and people don't stomp on it. They wait till it's done and then they look at it. You know, it's that kind of thing. Yeah. And you you know you go in the subways on the metro and you have a quartet playing you know Bach and it's the level is unbelievable. So, yeah. okay, so he's coming from there and then so anyway, he he convinced. Uh, the, that, the uh, administration at that time for, uh, to, to support him. So he was right there. He went up to uh, D.C. You know, right when it was happening, and he was probably one of the first applicants for, for federal funding. The National Endowment for the Arts is part of that, was it? National Endowment for the Hum Humanities. There's two of them. But, like, he, he, <laughs> he, he followed up, and he, he came through with, uh, they came through with the, with the funding. So he, it was like a Grant proposal he put together. Yeah, Here's yeah it what sounds like it. That's what it sounds monies. like to me. Yeah, because he, there was not, there was nothing. It was just him. It was just him. There was no office. There was no staff. There was nothing. It didn't yeah. exist. Yeah. And the and the NEA was brand new. Brand new. And did they have a structure? To, I don't think I don't think they had anything either. It was they were so new with this thing. You know, they may have. Yeah. They were probably more uh, together than the, than uh, here and here. Whatever states were applying. This is probably true. Yeah. They probably had uh, infrastructure. They probably had, you know, uh, 
program people and staff people in it and some sort of administration, but there was nothing here that I know of. So I find it interesting that he, you know, Ayn Rand, Ayn Rand mm. studied architecture mm. to write mm. her novels, and mm. I find it interesting how that uh, is sort of a bridge between it, in engineering and organizational development and art. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's it was, it was really you know, it, but they, it, well, the thing was what was good was he had the right people. Yeah. He had uh, Pandi Okuchi, who was a uh, is an established businessman on. Uh, um, on Maui, who was also an art collector, and he had spent a lot of time on the mainland. And then uh, Najo Yoshinaga was uh, head of the Senate. I mean, he was just he was just a real, real strong uh, voice for local people in local politics, right? A real beacon, a real leader. Yeah. And then he had John Burns, who probably wasn't the most art-influenced guy around, but he he knew. They could see he could he, he could see the same thing, and he and he trusted the people he was with. That was the thing. So you know when you have that combination, it was just luck. To me, it was just luck. That's all it was. That they all ended no, up together. Yeah, because yeah, how same could time. you know who who would know that that would happen? Yeah. I mean, who would know that? How could that happen? Who would know that, that would happen? for states? What was what fifty nine? Six years later, you know that's that's amazing. Because mm -hmm. you know, young young newest state, right? No no history of any kind of. Uh, History at all as a state is like six years old, right? It's like wait, wait a minute, you know. And yeah. they're trying to pull this thing off. Okay, so anyway, uh, he the, he uh, set up his situation with uh, uh, his pe his principal people. You know, he's got a board together. Pundi was the first chair, I think. And then he got to go to the legislature and fight everybody else, you know, to try and get money for uh, uh, funding for art because art is art is kind of low on the on the on the list for. Uh, uh, Essential uh, programs of the state. So there's, the state has a uh, definition for essential and non-essential programs. Uh, essential programs are health, education, and welfare, prisons, things like that. Art is further down the list. It's down there, probably down there with DL and R. The state has a matrix of all state programs. Yeah. So it was way down there. So it was really rough. It was really hard to do that. But somehow he did it. Okay. So. If I understand it correctly, the first program was the Biennium Grants program. Everything was a GIA. Everything. Everything was a GIA. From, oh, grant and aid. From trying to get a typewriter for your office, <laughs> to trying to, to get a money, funding for a cop up project, to trying to get funding for a, 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 a portrait somebody was like. He, it all had to go on the same, when you know, when you go in, when you put in your, when you put in your uh, request. So here he is. Basically going in against you know like the airport, you need stuff for the airport, you need you need to repave you know Nimitz Highway, all this kind of stuff, and he's coming. Well, I need it, you know. So it's like, oops. It's, it's, really, it's really interesting if you think about it. So they were um, uh, awarded the NEA funding. Do yeah, you they got that in line. Yeah, yeah, they got that in line. Do you know how much that was initially? No, I have no idea, but it was small. Now we're right around six hundred thousand for for us right now. We're being five or six hundred thousand, but back then it was tiny. Whatever it was, I don't know what it was, but it was tiny because you have to match it, right? That's the whole idea of any. You have to match. You you have to get legislative money to match your um, NEA money. Uh, That's okay. how you do it. Okay. So they they get these monies and mm -hmm. they're being matched by the state. Mm -hmm. And how did they initially determine how they were going to dole that out? Where did it go? Yeah, that, that, I'm not really sure. I think that he, see, from what I understand, it was like him and a secretary, and they had an office somewhere. I think they were in the Gov's office or something, like just the two of them, right? It's like there's no staff, no office, no nothing, right? So uh, the, at, at that time, the boards was really hands-on, really hands-on. Now it's a policy-making board, but th back then it was, they probably worked on it. So they probably came up with, you know, the same kind of, basically the same structures that the NEA uh, Mandates. You need community involvement. You need legislative involvement, and you need certain regulations to be able to to promote a grants program, right? But it was probably really small. I'm not sure how they did it, but what they initially did was they had arts councils on each island. So, uh, Garden Island Arts Council, which is still around, Maui had an arts council, the Big Island had an arts, Hawaii Island had a arts in its own arts council, and. That's how they did. Hawaii, Honolulu had its own arts council, and the money, I, if I understand it correctly, went to to those councils, and they moved it out that way. 
Okay. Because that would make sense to me because they're on the island and they, they know who's doing what. They know right. which artists are, you know. Now it's much more uh, institutionalized, right? Everything comes with SFCA. So it's a, it's a, it's, there's a difference now. It's much more, you know, it had to go through all these government things, right? Like now they're called grants, but before they were purchases of service, they were granting aids. You know, there's all these different uh, functional things with government that they went through. But I think at that time, for a while, they, when they initially started, they did it that way. Because Price probably thought, well, they, you know, they're people that live there, and, you know, they should be able to decide who. Because Price is yeah. interesting. See, he, he has a European perspective, but he didn't necessarily pursue a Western perspective for art. I mean, he's tra obviously trained as an architect, which is, you know, fair, it's a fairly scientific uh, and artistic endeavor, right? I mean, you got to know what you're doing because you're putting up buildings that people yeah. that are going to work in. Right? I mean, it's like, you <laughs> it's know, pretty the, exact. The building falls down, right? But then the other side of it was, like, he started a dance council on each island. And the other part of it was, was instead of inculcating a purely Western uh, perspective of art, his thing was, well, who lives here, right? Hawaiian people live here. Japanese people live here. Chinese people live here. Samoan people live here. That's who lives here. And that's whose art should be promoted, preserved, encouraged, right? So it's a different, it's, it's totally different from what you would expect uh, in some places of the mainland. It's just, it's just different. Yeah. But it makes sense because this is where, this we, is are. where we are, right? Yeah. So that was, to me, was unbelievable for the time. It was just, because there, there's not a huge awareness of, you know, of those kinds of, uh, art coming from those cultures. It's, there's, there's not a huge awareness of it. There's just not. Yeah. And especially part of the United States. You have like singular bodies like in Chinatown, San Francisco, and you know, you know, in Koreatown and in LA and you know, that kind of thing. But it's it's a different it's a different thing. It's a different situation. Because he he understood it. He saw it. Because he was basically what didn't wasn't coming from like a a, a Western perspective. It was coming from like a European kind of perspective which yeah. is much, to me, much more open, much more accepting, much more tolerant of new stuff, you know? Because they've been around a lot longer, you know? <laughs> Europeans been around a long time. Yeah. So it's like, you know, they kind of look at stuff, you know? And so, and, and plus, and, and, and indeed, uh, supporting art, too, is, you know, it's, it's right there. I mean, you, France, what, the Ministry of Culture, is like hundreds of millions of dollars, hundreds of millions. I mean, it's like, it's unbelievable. I mean, the taxes are unreal, but... They, they think of it differently. Yeah, it's just a part of life. I, you know, it was something that I noticed when I moved here um, to Hawaii is uh, things like, and, and I, I'm, you're going to wonder where I'm going with this, but things like massage and acupuncture mm. are included in my insurance here. Yeah. That they would never be included yeah. in my insurance oh, yeah. in yeah. back in Chicago. Yeah. And because there's an awareness that that is part of yeah. health. Yeah. And I think it, it's another giant step further, and we're going to get there someday, mm -hmm. to recognize that being around uh, uh, artistic installations and having it in your life is part mm -hmm. of yeah. day-to-day -day health. So uh, the system as it is now with the SFCA and how the funds, it's decided how the, to whom the funds are awarded mm -hmm. and the amounts. Mm -hmm. That is, the architecture of that I think is pretty cool. And mm -hmm. um, uh, let me just say that you're listening to um, the Arts in Hawaii on thinktech.com. Thinktechhawaii.com, I'm Donna Blanchard and I'm talking with Charlie Medeiros of the State Foundation on Culture and the Arts. So let's talk about the architecture of the decision process here now for with the for SFCA. grants for grants you're talking about yeah okay uh, I am the administrator for the Biennium Grants Program and Biennium Grants Program was one of the, if not the oldest one of the oldest programs it was before like APP and special fund and all that stuff because everything was on one thing it was on one plate okay so what it is is we're, the way it is now is is there's mandates by the NEA and uh, Chapter Nine. Chapter 9 is our enabling legislation. It basically gives you the uh, uh, requirements for running the foundation, uh, running uh, a grants program, running an arts and public places program, and whatever other programs we're running. It should be in uh, the enabling of Chapter 9, which is either in the original or in amendments, because it can be amended, right? Chapter, any law can be amended. Okay, so what happens is the NEA requires community involvement, which means 
we have we set up uh, the community involvement by uh, you know uh, uh, recognized members of the arts community. Artists uh, can be potters, dancers, singers, musicians, uh, um, actors, actresses, um, whatever it is, depending on the, pr uh, the program area, right? So that's also uh, in, uh, it's also uh, uh, listed in our admin rules because you have like, you're enabling and you have admin rules right under that, right? Which you, which you must do. So what it means is basically in terms of, uh, uh, practically speaking, we set up for the Biennium Grants Program, it's run every two years. And what you do is you send out an RFP process initially where people, you know, put out, you put out your, uh, people are allowed to apply for two years or one year. And then there's a re review process, a constant review process. There's an initial staff process and then there's a, um, there's a review process done by community peer panels. The community peer panels are made up of, uh, for example, if you're in uh, uh, arts and education, you're going to have artists, you're going to have teachers, you're going to have arts administrators, you're going to have all of those people whose uh, daily work, day-to-day -day work is in that field, which makes sense. Mm -hmm. You'll have like two commissioners and you'll have staff there. And what they do is they, they, the incoming uh, uh, applications that were reviewed staff-wise and moved to eligibility they review them, you know, to see if they fit the guidelines for that particular area, which is, you know, they're, they're all, they're all uh, you know, the, the, the guidelines are published on, so it's all online, so you can see what they are. Okay. They, after, uh, the, the uh, panelists have them anywhere from 60 to 90 days, and they review them, and then we, we call, now, instead of <laughs> taking two or three days for program area, we can do it in like one day, because we do everything, everything's online. So what happens is, uh, people enter their uh, their initial uh, amounts request, uh, amounts and ratings, and then when they come to the meeting, they make a decision. They, they review them again and make a decision at the meeting on what they want funded and at what level. And then what we require is consensus on the dollar amounts, but not on the ratings. So you went through that. You saw how it worked. It's it's very it's very open. It's very. Um, uh, uh, everybody gets to have their voice heard. That's the whole idea. Yeah. And then at some point, you, the panels all decide what they want to do. And it's complete. It's basically following the NEA model. NEA uh, partnership grants or regional grants, exactly the same way. They, have, they, call, they, they put panels together and they have the community decide how they want that money to go out. I think that is so cool. Yeah. I, I really do. So people apply for a grant mm -hmm. and then you can go in and listen to oh, yeah. the the group discuss it sure. and yeah. it is it is truly a group of your peers yeah. mm -hmm. who um, go through the grant proposals and discuss them on the merits of the categories that yeah we, we try to we try the panel should be you know, the NEA has all these requirements and stuff but it's really hard the, the main thing is to for here because we're an island state we have to have in my mind we have to have island representation because you know for good or bad I would say at least 50 percent of the organizations that we fund on Oahu okay so there's an innate bias there so you need to have outer island representation you, you must have it otherwise that voice isn't heard yeah. okay so you know it sets up this it gets problematic because sometimes the the, uh, uh, the uh, panelists have less people on the islands have less uh, experience with some of the organizations here but it, but it works out in the end because the whole thing you want is this communication. You want openness and you want everybody to be able to have uh, a, you know, their say in terms of what uh, the, 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 uh, the merit of the proposal is. That's always the, the, the key thing, merit of the proposal. Right? That's yeah. what you're looking at. Because some people have, some, people, some organizations can afford a, a, oh, a yeah, paid this, grant proposal well, writer, yeah, you know, it's, and others are obviously right. someone in their spare time right. throwing this we, we, together. We range from paid writers to somebody in the, in the bedroom with a laptop, just, you know, <laughs> that's, that's it. Yeah. You know, and, and, and the majority of the people that we fund do not have paid staff. And by any grants, but they don't have paid staff. You know, and then there's, then there's always the issue of, you know, we, we fund certain government institutions, and there's always that question. Why is another state agency funding another state agency? That all, it, it's never stopped. But the panels work it out. They work through it, you know, they, they, because they have, the, they have the, uh, a lot of leeway. They have a lot of leeway, you know, and it gets a little heated at times, but that's the way it's <laughs> supposed to be.
Yeah. I mean, you know, I mean, I don't, I can't see any other way to do it when you, if you leave people out. You know, you need to, you need to be inclusive and include as many people as possible in what you do. Otherwise, you, you lack legitimacy. You know, there's, there's nothing there. And this is the bottom line is public money, right? So the public should have a say. Okay, that happens, and then a month later, a couple months later, uh, at this time, our budgets, our projected budgets, moving through the ledge. Hopefully, you know, and then you, uh, it, it should, it should, uh, there should be some kind of a contact point where we can see what the projected budget is, and then basically adjust the budget, the, the grants, uh, grant recommendations to that budget. They're not grants yet; they're recommendations. Because we don't, we don't have a budget yet, and we won't have. We have a projected budget, but we don't have a real budget. State, I think, what it is, policy is state policy is July one. Everybody's got to be ready, but that's, I've never seen that happen. <laughs> never. It's like, oh, okay. Nah, I've never seen it happen because there's always, especially now, it's it's such a rough time now. You know, it's it's rough. It's a rough. The last four or five years have been real tough. You know, but what I was going to say was though, getting back to the formation of the SFCA, it's gone through like various transformations, right? It was here. I mean, it was it was at it was on. Uh, let's be specific. It was on Merchant Street, and then it went to Bethel, where Kumakahua is. Really? Yeah, we were upstairs with you guys. I didn't know yeah. that. How exciting! For a little while, and then, <laughs> and then it moved, and then there was this, there was this other visionary group that came up because, uh, I'm just gonna, you know, there were you need those kind of people to 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 do things, and one of those people was uh, Governor and uh, Mrs. Caetano, who had this, this idea of you know well not only them but they were instrumental in having a museum for our artwork, so, uh, you know Governor Caetano, Mrs. Mrs. Caetano, and. Uh, People like uh, Senator Taniguchi, Senator Fukunaga, Senator Ige, uh, Asihara, David Ige, people like that, people in the legislature who appreciate art pushed for this thing back in the 80s, and they were pushing it for like 20 years. And, and what, what finally happened was there was enough momentum and enough fruition that you know, it, it came through, along with you know, community people like uh, Lisa Yoshihara and uh, uh, what we call Zimmerino, Tom Clovey, people like that, who had the vision, because we have all this art that we're collecting, right? And, and, but, and you can put it on, we, we put it, you know, the art public places, is the whole idea is to have it in public buildings, right? State buildings, right? That's the whole idea. This is your art. It goes on a state building. Yeah. And so, you know, we did that, but then you'd have to go to all the state buildings to see all the art, right? So it's really hard for somebody to do. But if you got it in one place, then people can look at it. So Governor Caetano had this idea that, well, why don't we put it here, you know? And so he, 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 uh, he found a way to... Uh, <clears throat> have this building, the Hemeter building, uh, in place as a museum, and it worked. <coughs> it, was, it wasn't easy, but, it, but it, it, it took some work to do, but he did it. And he pulled it off, and then we moved in there in 2000, I think 2000, and then we opened the museum in 2002. And that's where we are now. And it's beautiful. Thank you. And you got a lovely little gift from Morocco not too long ago. Yeah, yeah, right, right in the front. front lawn. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> lovely fountain. Mm -hmm. um, so, the where are you in the process right now with the the granting process? We're, all of the what we're doing now is completed. all the problems are completed, and what we're doing now is we're compiling final reports, and uh, we're trying to get final payments off. That's what we're doing, as you well know. I, well, I do know that. Other people may not have known that. I'm well aware of that. Mm -hmm. uh, um, so. Let's talk about the programs that are actually funded by the SFCA, some of the organizations sure, that sure. you work with. Yeah. And um, uh, we, we, yeah, we can look at these. First of all, let's talk about, you know what, the, um, what has happened with the funding of the SFCA yeah, okay. and some, maybe some of the programs that have been funded yeah. in the past. The uh, SFCA has gone through uh, the same, wh where we are now is where the mainland was like four years ago when the recession started. It's real rough. It's bad for funding anyway. Okay, so when I first started the State Foundation, the, the grants, Grimanian grants was 5.3 million. Okay, it's a lot of money. Yeah. It's a lot of money. You know, over 200 projects, you know, it's huge. Okay, there was a change in administration in 94, 95, and the grants budget went from uh, 5.3 to 1.8 in a year because of the financial crisis. So from about 95 to about 2002, it was the, the amount kind of stayed between 1.3 and 1.8, right in there. It, would, it, it varies every year, see, it, because you have to go to the legislature and compete 
with other state programs for money. I mean, that's basically it. Okay. So um, there was a change in administration in 2002, and so that there was another effect on the biennium grants budget. Okay. So there was there was a loss of half a million dollars in general funds because we have. Our funding is general funds, uh, NEA funding, some private funds, you know, that kind of thing. And then APP has its own, the 1% has its own, APP has its own funding source. Okay, so that, there was a change in administration, there was money lost, but then there was money put back in the, in the, in the form of TANF money, which is temporary assistance for needy families, right? It's, it's a federal program. So we got $620,000 for that as in place of the general funds. So we were okay till. Um, from 2002 it, it, to about 2008 when the recession hit. And that's when it really got real bad, really bad. So um, uh, it affect, the recession affected every, you know, the mainland and affected everything here too. So there was major, major cutbacks in state programs. Now wait a minute, what year did you go from 5 million down to 1.8? Uh, 95. That was 95, mm -hmm. okay, so you already took that. Oh yeah, that was huge. 80, 75, 80%? That's huge. Yeah. And yeah. were there organizations at that time that were unable to continue without the support? There were a few, too? but not as many now. See, Because the, they it, had other it, sources it, yeah, of funding it, yeah. as well. Yeah, it wasn't as, yeah. see, the, this last recession, this it was huge. I mean, this was the big one. This was the big one. This, this, that started eight years ago. I mean, 2008. Five years yeah, ago. Yeah, because it hit everyone. That, oh, yeah. That's that, this, that was, what hit Kumo see, so it, badly. Yeah, it, it, the one in 94, 95 was, it was kind of like just within Hawaii. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't like a national thing. So there weren't, I mean, people, they were in bad shape, but it wasn't as bad as it is now. There's no way, you know. So but what was good was we were able to stay and sustain that 1.5 to 1.8 <coughs> level for such a long time, from like 05 to 202. It's like seven years, you know. So because, see, what a lot of people got to understand is, is like, see, there's, you know, you, you don't you don't have to have an arts program. See, a lot of people don't understand that. You know, and you know, a lot of people in arts programs yeah, a lot don't of people understand in arts that. Programs <laughs> don't, you know, so sorry. Yeah. Keep the cards and let it short. I mean, you know, it's that's just the way it is. Because everybody thinks, well, you know, my, you know, my program is just worth as much as anybody else's. Why am I getting any funding? It doesn't work that way. State has priorities. Yeah. And you're either essential or non-essential. Okay, so uh, that's basically what happened. So. Um, but this last one in 08 really was, it was really rough, real tough on everybody. And that's when I, I think more of the organizations kind of, there were some that ceased operations and just kind of shut down for a minute. And then there were others that just kind of went under, right? And, you know, a prominent, a prominent organization that, that that happened to was like the Honolulu Symphony, right? Honolulu Symphony, just there's no more. It doesn't exist anymore, right? And that's like, what is it, the oldest one west of the Rockies, you know, something like that. It's an old one, you know. It's been around yeah, a long time. Yeah, hundred over a hundred years. But it was right? also one of the most uh, uh, established ones. You know, it's been around a long time, but it's it's just you know, the, the whatever you know situation it was in, it doesn't exist anymore. And then you have others, you know, but uh, you know TCM that uh, there was now there's a a, a, a a agreement between the Honolulu Academy of Art, Honolulu Museum of Art, formerly Academy. The museum of art and TCM, so they're TCM. They, yeah, the Contemporary Museum on up on Makiki. There's there's that. Um, there's other. Um, let's see. Uh, on Kauai, Kauai Society of Artists, I think they dissolved. See, there's a difference between somebody ceasing operations and they're just kind of waiting it out, and guys that have just gone completely under. There's a, there's a difference. But see, you know, the, the thing is, okay, the state isn't <laughs> really responsible for the ongoing operations of anybody. Either for profit or non profit. So it's it's you know, it state's big target though, you know. Easy to take easy to blame because it's a big target. But you know, you, you have to be you have to live in the real world and sometimes people who do art they're they're not as uh, sensitive to that. They're sensitive to their own art, they're sensitive to what they do. But, you know, in terms of fundraising and funding, then they're, they're not looking at the broader picture. Yeah. You know, because that's what you know, government's different. It's, it's like I said, it's like it's you know, art is, <laughs> my own opinion is, <clears throat> art has to do with creativity, ideas, freedom. See, government is rigid, it's structured. So there's a natural um, conflict there. Yeah. 
Let's, let's take a break for just a minute. You want to get a drink of water? Yeah. Uh, you're listening to Think Tech Hawaii, uh, Arts in Hawaii. I'm Donna Blanchard, and I'm talking with Charlie Medeiros from the State Foundation on Culture and the Arts. And Jay Fidel is in the house, and I believe has something you'd like to say, Jay? Absolutely. Thank you very much, Donna. Um, <clears throat> I just wanted to... All right. Donna? Yes. It's me, Jay. Hi, Jay. <laughs> I wanted to tell you about two things. Uh, first is uh, tomorrow on May 23rd at 1130 uh, at the Plaza Club, we're going to have this really spectacular Think Tech Hawaii Venture Capital Association program, calling it Housing in Hawaii, Waking Up to the American Dream at a Price We Hope We Can Afford. Okay, And our economist and provocateur is Paul Brubaker. Uh, our moderator is Harry Saunders, uh, who is the president of Castle and Cook Hawaii. And then we have a bunch of people associated with development of housing in Hawaii. Stanford Carr developer, uh, Tony Ching, who is the executive director of the Hawaii uh, Community Development Authority. Uh, Paul Kay, who does development for Kamehameha Schools. Nick Vanderboom, Vanderboom, who does development for Howard Hughes Corporation, John Wallenstrom, who runs Forest City, Hawaii, and John White, who runs the Carpenters Union at Pacific Resource Properties. Between those gentlemen, we probably have, well, in the multi-billions of dollars of, of housing coming online here in the near term. It's quite an amazing crowd. So we have... Uh, we have housing around the block at this program, and as I say, sort of like art, you know, Charles, as a, a great state deserves great art, well, a great state also deserves great housing. I'm not sure which is more important, but we, we know they're both, they're both truisms. <laughs> so if you want to come to that tomorrow, you guys, I hope you consider it, because the, right now the crowd is approaching 200. It's like a record record nice. gate on, on it for us. Yeah. Uh, you can sign up at hvca.org. That's Hawaii Venture Capital Association.org. And we hope to we hope to break 200 if we can. Uh, in June, uh, with the help of uh, Ginny Pressler, who is Executive Vice President of Hawaii Pacific Health, uh, which runs uh, Kapilani Hospital and also Polymomi and other uh, medical establishments, uh, is moderator for our program called Healthcare in Hawaii. If you think it's expensive now, wait till you see what happens. That's Thursday, June 27th, 1130 a.m. again at the Plaza Club. Uh, and Ginny will be our moderator. We'll have half a dozen guests in, in government, in industry, uh, and in medicine itself. So if, if we don't care about health, our own health, state health, who will? And I guess I could say, I hope you don't mind me saying this, but a great state also deserves great health care. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just yeah. like art and just like housing. So if you want to come on June 27th, again, sign up on hvca.org. Thanks a lot, Donna. Back to you. Cool. Thanks, Jay. And um, I think that's so cool that we're going to be over 200 people for yep. the luncheon tomorrow. It's great. blowing up. Um, so, Charlie, let's talk about the actual organizations. And I guess mm -hmm. um, I, I was—I got to be part of one of the panels yep. this year, and I loved going through the process. I loved—I felt like I was doing my duty to be a, to be a part of that process. But also, I learned about programs that I didn't know existed before mm -hmm. as we were going through that. Mm -hmm. And um, so I'd like to spend a lot of time just going through the organizations that mm -hmm. the SFCA funds and talking about uh, sort of a, maybe we can have a bird's eye view of what those organizations yeah. do, what, sure. what's out there yeah. for us to enjoy. Yeah, there's, there's five areas we fund, arts education, community arts, heritage and preservation, uh, presentation, and presentation performing arts. Okay, there are uh, the... Uh, the organizations that apply to us are in those fields, and they they can choose, you know, what programs and projects they want to fund. So, for example, in arts education, we have uh, the Alliance for Drama Education. They do work at Farrington, you know, with uh, underprivileged kids. George Cohen and those guys is great. You know, they teach them uh, theater and acting skills, right? They do that kind of thing. And then, uh, oh, oh no, I should start. I should go back by saying we we we're funding from Kau on the Big Island to Kapa'an, Kauai. 
the range is broad. Uh -huh. The only island we don't fund is Molokai, and okay. that's because we used to fund them a long time ago, but they, they're un, they're, uh, the resources are real uh, uh, short there. So, you know, we, we, st we have lots of uh, uh, public art there, you know, in the schools and stuff, but we used to fund the Molokai Music Festival. We don't fund it anymore because they're not coming in. See, it's, it's rough on them. They don't have the, the neighbor islands are really short on resources. Yeah. But, you know, we're on uh, 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 Kauai, Maui, Big Island, and Lanai. Okay, so um, um, we try and, as much as possible, have as much inter island action as possible. But, it, like I said, they're under resourced and it's hard for them to, to uh, apply sometimes. But, uh, you know, it's some of the groups that. Uh, uh, you know, say in the uh, area of Hawaiian uh, uh, preservation, of Hawaiian art, uh, Hawaiian culture, uh, we have groups like the Hula Preservation Society. That's Miley Lu. She she does a lot of great work with hula and archiving, uh, all the okapuna and stuff like that. Um, Prince Lot Festival. It's uh, down at Damon Track in Wanalua. Uh, Non-competitive hula festival. It's great. You know, big trees and. Uh, there's no there's no pressure like in Mary Monarch. It's not it's not oh, yeah. it's a different direction. But it's but some of the same groups are there, right? And what organization is that that does that? Uh, that's um, uh, Moanalua, Garden, Moanalua Gardens Foundation, Prince Lot Hula Festival. Yeah, oh. We're, they're, they're, they've been around a while. But you know, Kulo he he youth brother Key Project. They have a Kipuka program where the you know uh, it's. Uh, summertime program where they have uh, they teach Hawaiian culture and art right and language there's a lot of UH Hawaiian language students that go through there right? oh okay so they're going yeah. in as kids no they're going in there as teachers they're teaching Hawaiian language oh, some okay. of them came up as kids oh okay but but we fund them so you know the language component is there and we fund it they have a whole lale at the end of the thing and everything's in Hawaiian nice. hey, who, who would have thought right so yeah. anyway there's things like that. Uh, we just recently started with Hana, Hana Arts again. It's that's really rough because we were, we were there like 10, 15 years ago in Hana Cultural Center. They kind of went under, but there's a new group, Hana Arts. They're, they work out of a, uh, a uh, farmhouse now, and they're trying to get things going there. Hana's real remote, you know. It's interesting though because there's a lot of fairly well-established, wealthy people on Maui. So to me, it's, it's kind of sad, but, but they came in. And so we we're, we're, we're have some outreach there. Uh, now, Leo Theater on the Big Island, Ka'u. Um, uh, Stu Guitar and Slack Key with, with the real people, Sir Inui and George, uh, let's see, what's his name? Uh, not George Kuo, but uh, George Kuo Moku. Um, and they, you know, they, they give classes and they teach uh, uh, kids there. So you know. yeah, kids get to go and learn, yeah, and learn from, from the real guys, from the, the real, real people. guys. That, yeah, there's, yeah, there's usually a concert component, a lecture demonstration component. They have to do both when they fund. So <clears throat> because that that's one of those things that because it's funded by the SFCA, mm. that's free, isn't it, for the people? No, no, who no. Are no, this, no, this, this, no this, well, some are free, some aren't. Okay. Yeah, you're allowed to charge program fees. Like whole symphony is like twenty bucks a ticket, right? Well, yeah. The opera is you know twenty bucks and up. But there are a lot of, uh, Prince Lot's free. I mean, there's, yeah, a lot of our, our programs are free. A lot of our, uh, you know, that's not a condition. It's not a requirement. Okay. Because, see, it's, it's, it's interesting. See, it's, <laughs> I mean, the, the point of what you try and do is wean some people off state support, right? See, I'm over here, and then I'm over here, right? But uh, by the same token, you need, you need a certain amount of funds to be able to administrate, right? You need to be, you need to, be able to run your organization. So it's, yeah. it's this constant battle. You and the nonprofit world understand it because you constantly need to fundraise. But the SFCA is there as kind of a support, it's kind of like a baseline support thing because the grants aren't big anymore. They, we used to have huge grants. There was like six figure grants before, just ridiculous money. Oh my gosh. Because it was $5 million. But that doesn't exist anymore. The new reality is, you know, like we don't have that many six, five figure grants. We don't have them. Not, the budget's not there. The world is in a different place. The environment's in a different place. It's just a different, mm -hmm. you know. And then because you know, there's some, you know, it, it could be worse. You could be in Kansas where they don't have a state agency. It's gone. They got rid of it, right? Yeah. Kansas, they don't have one. It's not there. I didn't realize that. No, nope, it's gone. So there's different, and then parts of the country, different parts of the country are in different uh, phases of their economic uh, recovery. So it's difficult. Like again, you go back to priorities. Every state has one, right? 
Okay, so, but, but State Foundation is there as kind of like a backup. And the other thing it does is it's, it's good for uh, leverage. Okay, I used to work at the Hawaii Community Foundation for a little while. And one of the things you, you're taught to look for is established funders, right? Whether it's mainland or wherever it is. So when you see something like SFCA on it, you know that it went through some kind of vetting process. It was reviewed by competent people in the peers in the field, right, that are in the field. And you know that there was a, a fair, uh, a fair uh, voting process to get that thing through. Yeah. So those people, as you already know, when you put those things down, like whoever you're going to, Ford or Rockefeller or Reader's Digest, they look for stuff like that because they can just email and check. It's real simple, mm -hmm. you know. So SFCA is good for leveraging other monies from other funders. Yeah. Because we're like, you know, we're like the good housekeeping seal of art right here locally. I mean, we're still there, you know. We're still, still <laughs> well, yeah, I know you want to get organizations, you want to get to organizations to the point where they're not coming to you with their yeah. hat in their hand. Yeah. But yeah. I got to tell you, it's going to be a long time. It'll be before a long time, yeah, that. because this this last this last thing, this last recession, is really really rough. I mean, huge mainland foundations cut way back on funding, way back. Some of them even stopped funding yeah. because they because their portfolios are down. You know. You, your, their investments are down, so they, they don't have any money to give away. They, they have barely enough money to survive. So that sh shook down, that, that shook out down to the public sector, right? Because <clears throat> private sector funding is, is fantastic, right? Hawaii, Hawaii Community Foundation is an incredible, incredible resource. It has unlimited potential, unlimited, because they're not, they're not um, uh, conditioned by uh, government requirement or, or um, regulation or federal they don't have they're, they're not encumbered by that they don't they can do almost anything they want right. it's unbelievable but but that but in by the same token it's it's hard to get funds out of there because they can do that because they're private right it's the, the requirements are much more stringent much well more and stringent. the the sfca requirements you have certain categories mm -hmm. that those grant proposals need to fit answer and right. fit right. and if they do you are going to get a score that is going to give you some portion of the monies that are coming well out. hopefully not all the times but hopefully because well, there's some some applications that weren't funded yeah right? but I those mean, are yeah am i right those yeah. organizations don't fit that's the right. requirements that's right. then they're not that's able right. to because it's, it's all it it's all it's all there you know yeah. what they need to hit but you can apply to the community foundation mm -hmm. and you can fit the requirements and they can say <laughs> yeah. no yeah that's right that's right <laughs> you, you may not even get in the door because it's private see yeah. that's the thing that's the big difference but it's an incredible organization they're you doing know, so yeah they, they do, they're they do doing wonderful and they're things starting and up again they're starting to do this flex community program again because they were, they were cut back, way back for a while, you know, and they were, it was rough. Because outside of us, where are you going to go? In terms of a, uh, we have what's called an open call, okay, where are you going to go? See, because community foundations, you have to come in through uh, family literacy, smoking, or children's literacy. You, you, that's what your program had to be in order to, to, uh, to fit the, the requirement, fit the guideline. It's, 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 it's an open call. You know, so as long as you're you're in there, you know, and you 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 can the requirements are all in line. You can see it. You know, you'll you'll be okay. You know, it's not as rigid as the as the. Um, it's rigid in a different sense, but it's not as uh, confining as uh, private sector funding. Because private sector funding, you have to strategize for you, wherever you're going. Ford, Reader's Digest. You have to you have to meet their guidelines and their requirements. You have yeah. to do it that way. And sometimes you have to know somebody at the table. That's it. Those that's discussed. that's it. Absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's a different thing. Yeah. So you've been with, you've been with the SFCA for the last twenty years. Yeah, <laughs> feels like two hundred. No. And before Sorry. that, you were with the Community, Community Foundation, Foundation just for a couple of years. Yeah, right. right. But yeah. that's where you sort of cut yeah. your teeth on. Yeah, the on, on philanthropy this. and funding and funding grants and stuff. Yeah. So for, you've yeah you've been there for twenty years. That's why you can look at these organizations and rattle off what they all what they're all doing for the community, the um, Lanai Art and, Cult and Culture Center. Yeah, they, they're, well, they're relatively new. They, they started, uh, they're a branch, they have, see, they were initially started by, it sounds to me like they were started by that uh, Murdoch. He, he built hotels and he also built an art gallery and they were like an offshoot of that. <laughs> so the, the organization's in the art gallery. So that before, they, there was nothing there. They didn't have anything there. The only thing we had there was APP. Or just our regular um, relocatable and portable stuff in the in the schools and in the state buildings. That's it. They didn't have any programs, uh -huh. so now they they got it and it's been running for a while. 
Okay, wait, let me, let me condition this thing now. Okay, okay. this is, Biennium Grants is, is a one program, but we also have an arts education program, which is run by Vivian Lee, and we have a folk arts and community program that's run by Denise Miyahana. Okay, they also give out grants, okay, but in a different fashion. Okay, uh, Vivian Lee uh, does all of our arts education stuff, and she does artists in the schools. You know, she works with the schools a lot. Uh, Denise has a really neat uh, position because she, she does folk arts things, but she also does community underprivileged and I forget something some other kind of thing. But it's but sir, they can they can really um, they can really design stuff easier than in the biennial grants. They can design things. Oh, you mean the, yeah, their programs aren't as rigid? Yeah, yeah. They can they oh. can design stuff. The folk arts program is an individual funded. Program. That's been apprentice program has been for years. It was you know that's we, where we have um, you know uh, everything from Okinawan dance, slack key to uh, Korean dance to uh, now uh, uh, you know all sorts of folk arts that are that are in, uh, that are uh, based here, right? Yeah. From whatever it used to be like Laotian and Vietnamese projects, uh, Chinese theater, Chinese opera, you know all that kind of stuff, and then. One of the projects she's doing now is just really, really exciting is this holly project that she started, and it's basically building Hawaiian hollies out of, you know, peely grass and all that stuff. And they got all these uh, oh. practitioners to build, like in Manoa. Oh, and, wow. and she, but she, she funded that with NEA money. So it's, that's really great, you know. So it takes some of the pressure off of the Biennium Grants, which is the biggest program. It's the biggest grants program we have. But it's also the one that... Um, so you can't, you can't be everything to everyone. You can't be everything to everyone. So they, though, what they do helps to balance it out, hopefully. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it, they do good work and, you know, you, you know, people need to know who they are and what they do, you know, and that kind of thing. So it's not just, this isn't just the one grants program. This is, it doesn't work that way. We used to have another one called the Individual, Individual Artist Fellowship Program, but we couldn't, couldn't sustain it. We also had a History and Humanities program, which we couldn't sustain because those positions got... Uh, there was a RIF reduction in force uh, three years ago that we lost those positions. Oh. Okay, but we we had a, a several, you know, we, we took a big hit. We took we lost 33 percent of our staff, and those the granting position, uh, the uh, grant making positions, and the infrastructure for those for those positions was lost. You know, we lost clerical, we lost the the, the positions themselves. So we're trying to keep that going. You know, you, you're juggling two or three things, but yeah. It's kind of like the way you guys do it, you know. Mm. We're kind of in the same boat. It's yeah. kind of the same thing. Yeah. Uh, you're listening to Arts in Hawaii on Think Tech Hawaii. Um, and <coughs> I'm Donna Blanchard, uh, Managing Director of Kumukuhua Theater, and I'm talking with uh, Charlie Medeiros from the State Foundation on Culture and the Arts. Um, yeah, some of these other organizations, and, and, and I do want to say the Biennium Grants Program that you have, I. I think it's wonderful because it forces organizations to think two years out. Yeah, right. right. And particularly mm -hmm. with smaller organizations, maybe some of the less mature ones, you're thinking of getting through tomorrow. You're mm -hmm. thinking of getting the next show open or you know, whatever it is, mm -hmm. to sit down with a grant application that forces you to put together a budget two years in advance, mm -hmm. I think is a really wonderful tool. And a lot of people well a lot of people don't agree with me when they're actually in the process because it's hard. Yeah, it is. But, it, but that's what you need to do, and especially with now that our funding is going down to like a lot of NEA funding and, and general funding. But I'd like to say that the NEA is exploring different areas of program, different new areas of programming, such as uh, programming for the elderly. Okay, they're coming out with programs, so they're exploring that. Mm. So if we can find an, an opening there and get uh, access to that kind of funding, we'll try to do that. The other thing is the sequestration thing, right? You know, that's on everybody's mind and stuff. Okay. Yeah. What we found out so far is we're going to be all right. It's not going to be the huge hit that we thought we were going to take because it, it could be bad. I mean, I, a friend of mine has, the uh, husband works out at Pearl Harbor. It's, it's Fridays are off. It's gone. He only works four days a week now. It's fr he's furloughed Friday. You know, right. It's gone. But the sequestration effect impact on us is not going to be as strong as we thought it was going to be so we're going to be okay we're going to be all right because that you know we really need the NEA funding you know we need it we need to have that because that's a, a large amount of our funding now you know because we don't have the general funds we don't have the general fund access anymore we don't have that and we well we don't have the TANF access either that would be great you know to do that but we don't have it so 
just to alleviate, because I've had questions, I have people call me about that, you know, how the, how the you know, sequestration, it, it, it will affect us, but it's not going to be as uh, negative as we thought it was going to be. And then again, you know, you got to look to the NEA for, uh, uh, they, they're kind of our, uh, uh, you know, we have a partnership grant with them where we match, you know, what they give us and stuff. And, you know, they've been real good to us. NEA has been you know, really good considering what they've gone through because they've been cut too. Yeah. yeah. Right. Two years, two years in a row they got cut. Oh, yeah. And the TANF funds, mm -hmm. you used to get the TANF funds, yeah. and that, when did that cease? That's uh, two years ago, in 11. Yeah, that, that was a big hit. You know, but it was, it was great to have it. You know, any, <laughs> right now, anything is great to have. Any kind of funding is great to have, but that was great. Because TANF funding gets uh, reauthorized every four years, and it's $90 million. I mean, it's huge amounts of money. Huge amounts of money. But that's strictly going to homeless? It's strictly going to uh, DHS uh, programs. Strictly now, they they moved everybody back. Who was in? There were there were about eighty to one hundred, uh, maybe eighty organizations involved in that. We were one of them. But the you know the state had to, like I said, four years ago it was we were like wait a minute you know stuff's getting tough here because you know you got to figure, you know the, the what is it the biggest tax revenue resource for the state is the visit industry, and that was downhill for a while. So now it's coming back. It's doing really good, right? The last year or two years have been really good. But but it's, it's, it's this constant uh, adjustment you have to make because I know the council of revenue is just they just made another adjustment they had to they made an initial projection now they dropped at a point and that's a lot of money a lot of money because you know like I said the biggest revenue tax revenue uh, uh, resource for the state is the visitor industry yeah we're we're all, we're all, yeah, we're all pretty on that. dependent on well, that. we're feeding it too yeah we're, true that's true we are a part of it yeah. some of the organizations that you fund have. Um, go into schools and work with kids, yep. work with kids who yep. other the school programs have been yep. cut and this is the only way that they have yep. access to yeah. the artistic process. Well, we have, yeah, it's, it's, what's good though is we have like, uh, Susan Hogan, who's another one of our staff, runs an art mental program, it's really good, you know, they bring kids up, all these little kids, all these kindergarten kids, the high school kids, and they, we bring them in, that's free, right? We pay for the buses and stuff. And they, they have a whole half day at the, at the museum, you know, and it's all structured, they have classes they gotta go through, you know, and they, but they do a project, they do an arts project. There's a lecture, they do a project, they, they can take the project with them. Um, and then they, you know, they, they go, some of them, that's the first time they've ever been in a, in a museum or a gallery. Oh, yeah. first time, for some of them, it's going to be the last time, right? But it's there. They don't have to pay anything, it's free, there it is. And then they go out and run around in the park, and make, and run around in the front yard and make lots of noise, right? Because otherwise, <laughs> it's, a, it's just this big building with bureaucrats in it that are all kind of like, yeah. These kids, you know, it's like, <laughs> no, it's it's that's great. I think it's great. I like to see them running around and stuff. You know, it gives the building some life. You know, oh, yeah. that's the part. Okay, we're. Um, I think we're out of time here. We had. Um, uh, I, I, you know, you were worried that we weren't going to have enough to talk about for the whole hour, and there's lots of other organizations I'd love to talk about, but uh, we need to wrap it up. Um, this is Donna Blanchard for Think Tech Radio. We've been discussing theater with our guest Charlie Medeiros of the State Foundation on Culture and the Arts. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. I really Thank appreciate you. it. And Thank thanks you. for listening. Think Tech will be back next Wednesday for the Arts in Hawaii show with me, your host, Donna Blanchard. So please tune in on Think Tech Hawaii or thinktechhawaii.com, and we will see you then. Thanks. Thanks. For some reason, the clock went back to zero. It's not reform. We had a piece of gear.